Welcome everybody to the first keynote session in this year's annual Sustainable Development Fact. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Kalanidhi Vairavamurthy. Dr. Kalanidhi Vairavamurthy is an internationally recognized water resource management expert with a particular interest in urban water issues. He combines a strong engineering background with particular uh, in experience in the international domain. He has published extensively and has a strong profile working closely with the World Bank, UN Habitat, UNESCO, uh, Asian Development Bank, the European Union, among others. And he has led several urban water management projects for these agencies. He is currently a member of the Asian Development Bank's uh, Water Advisory Group. He has joined the International Water Association from the International Water Management Institute, where he was previously the Deputy Director General. He is currently also a professor, an adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Uh, so my own research also being in the area of uh, desalination and energy efficiency of desalination, it is indeed a great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kala Nidhi and moderate the session. So Dr. Kala, uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Good, good morning. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, we will momentarily okay. make you co-host so that you can share yeah. your... Please, screen. if you could just give me share screen. Uh, um, is, is that good now? I can share screen? Yes. Okay, so can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, uh, okay. very well. Okay. So uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and can I just begin by saying that it's, it's indeed a, a great honor for me to be here at the third edition of the Sustainability Fair, which is organized by the Kiram C. Patel Center for Sustainable Development. I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but I was actually the first dean of uh, the Patel Center in the United States, and then I elevated the center to a college. So we established the Patel College of Global Sustainability at the University of South Florida, and I was the founding dean of that college. And so really, it's, it's a big honor for me to be able to speak to you today, because it's, uh, I remember the first meeting actually I had with the then um, director of uh, IIT Gandhinagar, who visited us in Florida, in Tampa, and they were just discussing the, the, the idea of establishing a center at the time with Dr. Patel, Dr. Kiran Patel and myself. Uh, so we met with them several times while they were in Florida. So it is really a great honor for me. And so I would like to thank Professor Sudhir Jain, the director of IIT Gandhi Nagar, for facilitating this fair. And also Dr. Manish Kumar from the School of Earth Sciences for facilitating my presence here. He's been very active in the IWA. And so I'm also very, very grateful to him. And of course, it's, it's an honor for me to be presenting after Sri Vijay Rupani, the Chief Minister of Gujarat. Um, finally, I'd just like to thank uh, the vibrant Indian chapter of IWA. We have various institutions associated with IWA, which are you know, in different offices around the world, but we have established now a very, very strong base in, in India. And so I'm very grateful for the Indian um, IWA as well. Um, I'd just like to start with a very short summary of IWA. Most of you know we're an international water association. We um, have probably around 10,000 members of the big experts from around the world, uh, both from academia and also from practice. We uh, publish some 17 journals, some 800 books. And we, in a normal non-COVID year, we would have a conference every week of the year. But really, we're an organization that tries to um, be at the cutting edge in terms of water research and water practice, both in developed and developing countries. And so, you know, we have a lot of active participation from, from India, particularly in terms of editorial activity with our journals and, you know, uh, chairing various committees within, within the IWA. I'd like to really start my presentation by talking about some of the challenges that we see in the water sector. Um, and I think one of the main challenges is that we, are, we have built systems really based on a 19th century concept around the world. And I'm talking here primarily about urban water systems. Uh, we built systems 
based around ideas from the 19th century where we thought populations would remain relatively small. We thought that water would be abundant forever. We thought the environment was benign. And so we develop systems which are primarily linear systems where we take water from afar, we move it, we treat it to one single quality, which is high quality drinking water. And we use this very high quality water for all types of purposes, including important purposes like domestic use. But then, you know, we use this very high quality water for flushing our toilets, for washing our cars. And we use this water only once and then we throw it away, either with treatment or without treatment. And this has been the approach that's been adopted in, in the, the, the Western countries. It's been adopted by many countries in the South. But unfortunately, it's not very affordable, right? And it's highly energy intensive. And we presented it as a zero or nothing proposition. And so many countries struggle to maintain those levels of service and, and the sorts of costs associated with those systems. And so we have you know, currently still something like 800 million people that don't have access to improved water sources. And we have 2 billion people that don't have access to sanitation. So we're, we're, we're moving forward, but the problem is getting bigger more quickly than our ability to address the problem. One of the biggest challenges we have is in relation to sanitation or wastewater and wastewater treatment. We have done okay in bringing water to an urban setting, but we haven't paid much attention to what happens to that water once it's being used. And, you know, this statistic, which is still relatively accurate, I think there's been a slight reduction. Um, recently, it was reported by the UN, but about 85% of all the wastewater that we generate, it goes untreated. And it's not only in the usual countries we would expect, like sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia. We find this problem in South America. We find this problem in Central Asia and also in parts of Eastern Europe. And so this is becoming a big challenge for us. How do we deal with this wastewater? Because, you know, it has, um, of course, environmental effects, but more importantly, it has very serious public health challenges. Now, where we have built systems, and this is a slide from a study we did at my last organization, which was EMI. We have um, built lots of wastewater treatment systems. And this diagram is from Ghana. And at the bottom, you can see the, the areas where we have those wastewater treatment works. And on, on the top, you can see that the number of treatment plants. But I just want you to pay attention to that slide, because when I press the button, you can actually see which wastewater treatment works are actually functioning. So they built this many systems, but only this many are functioning. And this is very typical in many countries around the world where we are engineering our systems in a way that are not really appropriate to the local context. And so, you know, ultimately what happens is that these systems become dysfunctional. And so we have to rethink the way in which we engineer um, our systems. But there are, there are huge opportunities. I think the area where we see the greatest innovation in terms of water is around uh, wastewater treatment and sanitation. And, you know, if you think about the Western countries, the last 40 to 50 years has been like one big pilot study. They built very large, clunky, not very effective wastewater treatment systems. But over time, they've experimented and experimented. And now you're just seeing the emergence of some very efficient and effective wastewater treatment systems. And so the systems that you're seeing now are becoming much smaller, they're becoming much more energy efficient, and they're actually becoming much cheaper, um, both in terms of OPEC, in terms of CAPEX and OPEX. But what's more interesting is that these systems are being designed in a way where the waste streams are viewed as uh, beneficial, which means that we can extract value from those waste streams. And most of the advancements you see is in the modification of the physics of uh, the fluid itself. So we change the viscosity and we change the settleability. And the other area of innovation is in terms of advanced controls. And so we see a lot of innovation in terms of sensor control uh, and, and sort of data and that analytics that allows us to have more sophisticated control. So I think a country like India, where there is a huge program in terms of the, the construction of uh, sewage treatment works, there is really an opportunity to sort of rethink the types of technologies they adapt, adopt and the types of systems they put in place so that from the outset, from the design stage itself, these systems are built in a way that they can adapt to future changes 
but more importantly, that these systems are, you know, from the beginning, almost water machines, right? They're machines that can generate energy. They're machines that can capture nutrients. They're machines that can use the water multiple times. So the India is really on the cusp of a very exciting time because, you know, there's a huge interest now in building these systems. And I think the next 20 years will be really the golden era in terms of wastewater, certainly in India, but around the world. The other challenge we have is in terms of the providing people with a, uh, adequate water. And this graph is just, it's a slightly an older document, but it's showing what the, uh, the percentage of populations that have continuous water supply in, in cities in Asia. This is from the ADB. And, you know, some of the large cities in, in India, for example, still are not able to maintain a 24-hour supply. And this is really quite a challenge that, that has to be addressed because, you know, intermittent water supply, although it's a reality in many places because there's just not sufficient water, it comes with lots of issues and problems. And so, you know, we have to sort of reimagine how we are providing water supply in these cities where we have water scarcity. This is another diagram that shows you the non-revenue water in those same cities. And what, and sorry, and what's interesting is that there's a strong correlation between those cities that have high degrees of intermittency with cities that also have high degrees of water loss. And so, you know, some of this problem is not really related to water availability, but it's also due to the fact that the infrastructure itself has not been well maintained. And so, you know, we have high losses of water. So you have in many areas situations where you're rationing water, but at the same time, the rationed water gets lost, which is, all, which is almost, you know, not a very good thing to do, particularly if, if there's water scarcity. So this is just an observation from, from various studies. Now, of course, the future is going to become more difficult for us. We know that climate change is taking place, which has an impact on water availability. But I think in many of the emerging economies, the bigger challenge is really people. You know, we're adding some 155,000 people to this planet every day. 90% of those people are coming from what we would say the emerging economies. And 90% of those people are living in urban areas. And in many of those urban areas, we don't have access to good water supply and, and sanitation. So these people are being introduced into areas where the, the water situation is quite poor. Now, what's interesting is that the, these people, the, these, the, you know, the population is not just growing, but the population is also growing up. And that means their living standards are improving. And so what you have is you have a situation where the number of urban dwellers is increasing. The amount of water those people want is also increasing because their living standards are going up. So we have this double whammy in terms of increasing of the demand for water. And on the other side, you have issues like climate change that reduce the availability of water. And so this supply demand deficit really becomes a major issue moving forward. And so we have to rethink the way in which we do water management. The, the other thing that I wanted to share with you, which um, is really around, around finances, right? And um, we have some serious problems. The estimated cost globally for achieving the SDGs, 6.1 and 6.2, is about $114 billion per year. And 80% of countries in this world are reporting insufficient financing to meet these SDG targets, despite increasing their own sort of national water and sanitation budgets by, on average, around 5%. Moreover, the maximum level of official development finance for drinking water and sanitation has really gone down, and it's around 18 billion, which is 15% of what is required. So the question is, if we're going to fulfill the 2030 agenda, the SDG agenda, how do we identify and mobilize resources, right, financial resources, because that's a big, big issue? And how do we design innovative mechanisms to channel those resources? And, you know, the question is, if you think about how we finance water, you know, we have, of course, the uh, costs, which I'm sure all of you are aware, aware of, the, the capital costs, the cost of service debt, your O&M costs, and then any investments costs that we have to make. 
And to repay that money, we have traditionally what we call non-repayable funding sources. So you have the tariffs that the users pay, we have the taxes that's collected by government, and then we have transfers from national and international bilateral multilateral organizations. So these are what we would call non-repayable finances, right? They don't have to be paid back. But that leaves quite a big financial gap, right? We're not, we don't have enough money to meet that demand. And so the question is, how do we start to develop you know, resources. And traditionally, we've gone to sort of, you know, what we would call concessional finances from things like the World Bank, the ADB, for example. But that is not sort of sufficient to meet that gap. So now there's this issue about how do we start to access commercial finance. And this really becomes a challenge because we're not very used to applying for commercial finance in order to meet our uh, our goals. And so really the way forward is to have a blended finance approach where you're combining both your commercial finance with your uh, concessional finance and then coupling that with your non-repayable funding. The challenge that we have is that in order to raise finance, we have to be credit worthy. And in most utilities, what we see is that, you know, they don't really operate very well, right? So you have high, as I pointed out, high water losses, which drives up costs. And then investments are postponed. The service then deteriorates as a result of that. The customers, because they're not getting very good service, they have this sort of non-willingness to pay. And then, you know, the state has to provide subsidies. Then you have sort of efficiency dropping within that utility. And then, you know, basically what starts to happen is what you would call a vicious circle, right? You know, you're just not maintaining the system particularly well because everything above it is not functioning well. And so your assets start to go down the drain. They start to deteriorate. And so most utilities who are in this situation, they are not viewed in a very positive light in terms of credit. So what we have to try and do is to move from a vicious path to a virtuous path. And things like, you know, managing water losses is quite a good surrogate measure of the performance of a utility because it shows that, you know, they have good operational maintenance and they have good trained staff that can do it. And then your service quality starts to improve, your customers are happy, and then their willingness to pay improves. And then you can start setting, you know, a a sort of an appropriate tariff level, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, you know, you're viewed generally by creditors as being, um, it, you know, f- financially viable or, or credit worthy. And then you can start to sort of raise some of this money that's important. So this is sort of, you know, how we see utilities having to move. It's really trying to improve their own service operations in order for them to raise some of this money that's very important for them to move forward. So we need to move from a vicious path to a virtuous path. Now, in terms of the sector as a whole, what we're seeing is we're seeing a shift, right? We're seeing the sector becoming more smart. And for me, smart means three things, smart by design, smart use of water, and also smart control. And smart by design is using advanced technologies. We're starting to see a shift to more decentralized systems that give us much more adaptive capacity. But what I wanted to talk about is the other two today, smart use and smart control. So if we think about smart use of water, we have started to recognize that we have to think about the productive use of water. What is it we want the water to do for us? And how can we match the quantity and the quality of the water to that intended use? And this is now shifting us away from this idea that we should only have one quality of water for everything. But it's shifting us to start thinking about how can we have different grades of water for different uses. And that then allows us to use and reuse water multiple times. So we're starting to create different grades of water. And you see some examples. This is from California, the, uh, you know, the West Basin Initiative, where they create designer waters, right? So they use plug and play technologies where waters of different grades are being produced for different uses. And you're seeing things like, you know, people extracting water from a sewer directly and treating that water for things like irrigation purposes, et cetera. So we do see people recognizing that all water within the system is good water. It's just water of a different quality. So how can we sort of use that water productively in some way? Key to that is to have a very holistic view of the entire water cycle. And so you start to look at all water flows within the water system, and you recognize that, yes, they are waters of different qualities, 
but they are waters that can be used in some way for a productive purpose. So, for example, if I needed to have more increase in drinking water, then I can extract more surface water, I can extract more groundwater, I can desalinate, but I can also generate high quality drinking water through reducing my water losses. I can also generate high quality drinking water through demand management. And I might get greater efficiencies if I invest in leakage management and say demand management to produce that water rather than looking for a source very far away. If I want to flush my toilets, then I can use gray water or I can use black water after some treatment for that purpose. And similarly, if I want to irrigate, I can try and use these different grades of water, like the gray water and the black water. So what this model sort of, you know, what it does is it changes your perspective, where when you have an increase in demand, you look at water flows within your system and you try to sort of maximize um, how you can sort of share that water without having to necessarily extract more water. Critical to this is modeling. And you see uh, quite a growth in sort of what we would call integrated urban water modeling. And this is where we start to model packets of water as they move through the system. And each of those packets has a signature. And that signature is based on the quantity of water, the quality of water, the amount of energy that has been embedded into that water to produce it. And by understanding these packets of water, we can start to close the loop. We can start matching those water flows with different uses. And as I said, you tend to start to reduce your overall water footprint. This is some work actually I did while I was at the Patel College of Global Sustainability in Florida, and this was in Nairobi. And Nairobi was going through a huge sort of water scarcity issue. And so the natural response of the government there was to extract more water from far away and bring that water to the city. And so this was their existing water and the, the length of the bar is the amount of water available and the height is the cost. And their natural response to meet growing demands was to simply go and look for more surface water far away, right? Which would come at a certain cost. But they had some political issues because they had to go so far that the communities from where they were getting the water, they were not happy to give that water to the city. So we did our modeling and we did some analysis and we showed actually that there was enough water embedded within the system, you know, with leakage management, demand management, and also some potential rainwater harvesting and some limited cluster level gray water we used we found that there was actually enough water within the system and they did not have to build these capital intensive projects to move water from afar. We further did analysis where we started looking at more exotic uses of water. So this was black water and rainwater harvesting at the household level, which starts to become a little bit expensive. And we found that actually it cost a little bit more, so it might not be the best solution. So this type of modeling is not going to just say you must do this or you mustn't do this, but it starts to expose to you what are the most cost-effective solutions for you in terms of meeting your grain water demands. And we published this in a book, because it was a World Bank publication on, on, on water in African cities. You do see some very interesting innovations in this space in, in India. Um, so if you, for example, look at Chennai, you know, Chennai is a city that almost sort of on a Singapore model is developing a, a diverse portfolio of water sources. And it's very similar to the Singapore sort of four national taps. You know, it has its monsoon dependent surface water, which is about 530 MLD, which is augmented with groundwater. It has two desalination plants uh, of around 200 MLD, and it has two more under construction. So that's another source. It's embarked on a major rainwater harvesting initiative at the cluster level. And of course, you know, Chennai is very famous for reuse. And a large, you know, almost 10% of all the wastewater that's generated is being used by industrial estates, in particular the large car manufacturers. So Chennai really does have this diversity of water sources uh, or a portfolio of water sources that really gives it security. Because if, if one of those sources dries up, it can start to move to those other sources. And similarly, Bangalore is also doing something very similar, where 300 MLD of its reclaimed water is being pumped into sort of cascading tank systems to recharge its groundwater. And also it's embarking on some very innovative leakage reduction program that's going to free up quite a lot of good quality drinking water to meet, you know, 110, I think it is, new urban developments. So we're seeing a lot of innovation, even in countries like India, around this sort of you know, understanding the productive use of water and how to match different grades for different uses. 
And this is just a diagram of, of, of Chennai's sort of diverse sources. Now, you know, when we talk about looking at the entire water cycle in terms of water flows, there's also an opportunity by looking at the entire water cycle, looking at where we can capture other types of potential value, right? So, of course, there's energy, and there's, we know traditionally about energy production um, at the wastewater treatment works, you know, through um, anaerob anaerobic digestion and things like that, or microbial fuel cells. But you're seeing a lot of innovation now in terms of turbines turbines which can be even in the drinking water supply system that can generate some pressure so they can act as pressure reduction valves but the energy can then be harnessed and of course you get turbines within sewers uh, where you have big gravity drops that can generate quite a lot of water almost like a, a, a dam uh, like a hydroelectric type approach so this is another area and then of course there's nutrient recovery and a nutrient recovery can be harnessed both at the central wastewater treatment works but it can also be harnessed in terms of um, in a decentralized way from fecal sludge. So a lot of innovation taking place in nutrient recovery as well. So in addition to reusing the water, we can generate a lot of value. And a lot of people are very excited that this is going to make the financial viability, particularly of our wastewater operations, more attractive moving forward. It's still very much in the R&D stage. But it's, it's where we see the biggest growth in terms of research and certainly in terms of research dollars for, uh, for work that's being done both at universities, but also at sort of, uh, you know, up and coming R&D sort of um, what I would call sort of close to pilot stage type activities. The final area that I want to talk about is really around smart control, okay? And this is where we see a lot of innovation around digital water. And in the IWA, you know, we've established a very successful digital water program where a lot of white papers are currently being published around digital. And when we think about digital water, we're really talking about an ecosystem, right, where you have sensors that are capturing the data, a lot of innovation there. You have a lot of data processing activity, you know, advancements in, in that space. And then you have a lot of innovation around smart devices, devices that have their own onboard computer systems. And so people are talking about systems in the future where really you have silent running, right? People don't get too involved and the system sort of self-manages. So if we look at, at the system, we have innovations in terms of sensors. Um, you know, they're getting smaller, they're getting cheaper. We're also seeing a growth in multiple parameter arrays that measure many parameters across, say, for example, a contamination spectrum. And together, these sensors really offer a holistic view of what's going on in the system. And for example, here's some pictures of sort of like small sort of pipe ro robotics, which go, which go into the pipeline. And they are, enable you to look at where leaks are taking place and, and sort of really model what's going on um, within the water pipelines. But generally what I would say, and you can see it says there the four Vs, we're developing sensors that are capturing information at a faster rate. So the velocity at which we're extracting the information is increasing. Uh, the variety of things that we are measuring is increasing. That's the second V. Those two together give us much greater volume of data. That's the third V. And then, you know, the veracity of that information is improving. The quality of that information is improving. So quite a lot of work on sensor technologies. Moving on, we see quite a lot of work taking place in terms of data processing. So predicting analytics where we forecast what might happen in the future. So we're actually anticipating issues and upsets as well as identifying optimal sort of responses. And you see quite a lot of work on things like neural networks, you know, where we've got pressure and flow sensor signals in real time to detect and forecast pipe bursts and leaks. And we're also seeing developments in things like cognitive computing, where we're able to stimulate, simulate the human cognition process. So we can find solutions to fairly complex problems where the answers themselves might be quite ambiguous and uncertain. And in this regard, we're now starting to combine both structured and unstructured data. And we're making sense of it. As you probably know, a large part of the world's data is unstructured. I think they say about 80%. And this includes things like language in texts and documents, videos, audio data sources. So combining that unstructured information with structured information really tells us quite a lot about what's going on in the system. And then finally, you're starting to see quite a lot of innovations in terms of smart pumps and smart valves, 
automated control, machine to machine control. So machine, they're talking to each other. And this is all part of this sort of industry 4.0 that you've all heard about. So this is where you have these pumps and valves which have their own IP addresses. They have intelligent power sort of operated actuators and microprocessing control on board. So they can receive information, they can make decisions and they can respond. And so they actually start effectively acting as brains behind the automation that we're seeing in growing up. So this is sort of what we're seeing. And then collectively, all of this creates what we would call a, a silent running system, right? Where the involvement human beings start to become much more uh, less important. And you're seeing some good innovations in this respect. So this is an example, for example, with, with underground infrastructure. We know that, you know, we really don't know what happens to pipes once we lay them in terms of how they age and how, you know, cracks and leaks and things start to form. So you see the combination of structured and unstructured data that's being utilized. That's being coupled with external data from sort of weather so we can understand what's been happening to the soil in terms of shrinking and expansion in terms of traffic loading above pipes. And then we put them into sort of big data analytical engines. And we use that data to sort of do things like pipe condition assessment. And this is where we might combine hydraulic modeling to understand the significance of pipes with our predictions of pipe condition. And that then tells us which pipes should we respond to. And what we're able to do, because these models are you know, self-learning, we can send back information from our analysis to improve or to sort of recalibrate, if you like, these analytical engines that we've established. You're also seeing things like, you know, when there's a pipe burst, this, you have lots more sensors. Those sensors sort of send back information to a command center. You have inverse modeling that then can sort of almost pinpoint as a result of those pressure reductions and, and, and flow changes where the, where the leak took place. That then feeds an optimal valve isolation program, and that program then will inform um, uh, uh, automated valves to close so the system can be isolated and so the losses can be stopped and then repair teams are immediately informed exactly where the location of that break is what material they should take with them and they can then go and respond fairly quickly and the customer is informed in advance that a certain section of pipe is going to be isolated because of these losses and they they can then prepare for it and you see some of this type of ecosystems also taking place in developing countries. And this is an example from Niger in West Africa, where you have something called the CT Suite, and it combines smart and prepaid water meters, the CT meter, with a sort of an integrated software management system, CT Cloud, and then it sort of connects to a pay-as-you-go system so for customers through mobile phones can pay. And what you're basically having is you're having you know, a smart device that monitors flows and sends this information to an analytical engine that then triggers alarms if flows go above a suspected level. And those alarms are set because, you know, there could be a leak in the pipe or there could be illegal use. And these analytical engines also show customers how to monitor their consumption. And then it provides some gamification so customers can see how they are doing compared to other people in terms of water utilization and how much they're paying for water. So you are seeing some really good innovations where water rationing is taking place and people are deploying this type of technology. And in sanitation, we also see some of this happening where we're seeing sensors in, in septic tanks that then can automatically inform people who have to go and desludge those tanks um, when they need to desludge, it goes to a central control center. That central control center then does a routing algorithm and it informs these collectors which routes to take in order to optimize their collection and their weight carrying capacity of this fecal sludge. And what this does is it ensures that the septic tanks are being emptied regularly so that you don't have this problem where, you know, the stuff gets hardened up and then it takes time to desludge. And also, it can be done at a cheaper cost because you're sort of got in things like optimal routing algorithms and things that are that are late and out and you to do that. This is an example in India where you have some public toilets which have sensors built in and so that after one person uses the toilet, it automatically starts to sort of wash and clean the toilet. So they're sort of sealed units that sort of self-clean and self-wash and they 
they do this based on you know having a good understanding of the utilization of these units so some very very interesting stuff taking place in the digital space and certainly within iwa we are of the view that you know this is going to be the big enabler that allows us to do all these clever things that we want to do with water digital is not the end it's a means to an end one of the things that just to finish on the digital story and i'll close um, we've been looking at lots of utilities around the world, and we're trying to understand where do the utilities sit in terms of their maturity. And so we've classified different levels of maturity, and you can see that on the top of the diagram there. And so if you think about it, most utilities which we've studied in, in Europe and North America, uh, they tend to be in what we would call the basic or opportunistic level. And this is where you know you might have the deployment of sensors for leakage management and then separately and independently sensors for your activated sludge process so very much silo based operations and they tend to use sort of traditional static rule based models and so those rules are fixed they never change and they're collecting data from one particular device or one particular unit process and then it's sort of telling them what to do once a failure has happened. So it's not able to predict in advance what's going to happen, but it's sort of just allowing them to manage what when something happens. And these types of utilities tend to be quite reactive. They only respond to things once they've happened. As we move on, we see the sort of more advanced type of utility where, as I showed you earlier, you're gathering information from a variety of sources you have sort of fairly advanced analytical engines that are self-learning and you're using both your sensor readings but also external source data you're combining that and then you are sort of being very proactive so you know that your anaerobic digester might be upset sort of two weeks in advance or a week in advance or a pipe might break several months before it actually breaks and then you're able to tell your customers in advance that they have to be prepared for something. And similarly, the, the because of you know the, the 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 analytical engines are what we would call based on dynamic rules, they are constantly being updated and this is being refined. And these type of utilities tend to be very proactive and much more customer centric. And so what they tend to do is they work with their customers, they tell their customers in advance, you know, what they should be thinking about in terms of water utilization in terms of um, how they might save money, how they are comparing with other customers. So it's very much an engaged type of relationship that they have with the customers of, of, of their utility. Um, and then finally, the most interesting area that we see emerging is in terms of uh, the transformational space. And this is really where people are looking at the capturing of large amounts of data and how to monetize that data. And so, you know, what people from outside the water sector are starting to see is that water utilities actually have a lot of information about human behavior and a lot of information about a certain customer demographic. And they can use that information to uh, start to um, sell other products, but also to sort of understand consumer behavior that allows them to sort of, you know, in, in, a, in I don't think it's all great, but, you know, start to provide more and more services and people have even cited that the sort of google model that you have where google provides the basic service for free but they monetize based on customers activities and, and behavior through other types of service providers people are talking that in the future the water sector might supply water for free but it harnesses as much data from its customer base and it uses that to sort of sell other products and this is where people from outside the water sector are showing a lot of interest because, you know, water utilities tend to have a monopoly in a town or in a city. And the amount of information they harness about their customers is quite huge. And, you know, one area where we've seen a lot of interest taking place is in terms of health management and, you know, where you're seeing the deployment of smart toilets where you are able to capture information on people's health from their stools and from their urine. And so you can connect that with health providers and you can start to inform, you know, a healthcare provider that this person seems to uh, 
um, you know, their, their characteristics are changing a little bit and then interventions can happen much more earlier. And this is, of course, done in an automated way. And so, you know, this type of approach is something that you're seeing uh, quite a lot of researchers looking into. And interestingly, in IWA, we've been doing a lot of work, particularly in terms of COVID, where we've been looking at sewer, sewer surveillance and sort of being able to predict in advance outbreaks of, of COVID in certain communities. So it's, it's developing an early warning system by capturing lots of data, coupling that with sort of sewage characteristics and then being able to predict what's happening to the society based on that. And so you're seeing, you know, quite a lot of work being evolving in that space. Just to finish, we have an IWA digital program. You know, you guys can, uh, if you're interested, please feel free to sort of look at some of the resources that we have available on our site. We have a lot of events that have taken place and are going to take place moving forward. We were meant to have a big digital water summit last year, but was cancelled because of COVID. And we're hoping to have that towards the end of this year or early next year. And there are lots of white papers available that you can download. I finish with always this slide when I talk. And it's just to say that as a sector, because of all the global change pressures that we're experiencing in terms of climate, in terms of population dynamics, in terms of asset deterioration, in terms of money and the lack of it, um, we cannot continue managing our water systems the way we have traditionally done, this sort of 19th century thinking. So we can't stay in the business as usual. Right? I think where the water sector is at the moment is it's in the middle lane, right? We're trying to manage this sort of aged infrastructure, this 19th century system, and we're tinkering. We're trying to optimize them. We're trying to retrofit. But the gains are not sufficient to meet the needs. And so we're struggling, okay? And we're investing a lot of money because retrofitting is not um, cheap. I think we have to move to the far, far, you know, the far lane, which is really a paradigm shift. And this is where we start to rethink the way in which we use water and reuse water. We try to capture value from the waste streams. We start to move from sort of centralized systems to decentralized systems. We start thinking about the productive use of water. And I think we see we seize the opportunity that digitization might give us in, to enable us to do the clever things that we want to do. And I think a country like India, which is on the cusp of lots of infrastructure investments, particularly in terms of wastewater and sanitation, I think it really has the opportunity to reimagine how we do these things. And it might, it has the opportunity to really set the template with which the rest of the world starts to sort of build their systems. I think India can create the imperative for change that's desperately needed within the water sector. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.